Skill Builder 19. This one's going to be awesome. We're going to talk about organizing with rings, adjusting tails, and the compound loop technique. It's insane. Dude, that's a big round, bro. This is an organization hack by Cheech. That's kind of like me giving you dietary device or advice. Device. See, I can't even talk right now, Brig. Anyway. Don't listen to me on dietary stuff, but I, at least I know how to organize my desk. I just don't do it. Anyway, these are really cool. These are the Loon Bench Rings, and it's a it's a, a stainless steel cable coated with some plastic that is terminated on the end by these little uh, tabs. Okay. Now I apologize for the glare on the plastic bags. I, I realize it's kind of a pain in the butt with the lights. The way I have this set up right now is uh, in this package, I think there are three different length rings and these are all small. So uh, you can get a bunch of different types, but I just have a bunch of ice stub on this. So if I had this set up like this, I'd cut the corner off each bag and then I could just pull the bag out that I need while I'm tying. and. It's just a kind of neat way to, to store your dubbing. The other thing you could do, say you're traveling on a trip or going to tie at a show or something, and you have like a bag of biots, a bag of dubbing, a bag of hackle, a bag of hooks. You can just put one pattern on a ring so that you can just know this is my uh, parachute Adams kit or something like that. So the other thing you can do is uh, put nippers and things on your vest. Um, they're very you know low bulk, really strong as well. So I've been playing with them a lot. And I probably use them on the stream more than I do at the bench, but this is a really cool way to utilize them. We have a hook in the vise, and we're going to talk about tails today. So, um, a lot of times when I see beginners start tying, I'm going to farm out a few pheasant tails here, and we're just going to work with these. So, a lot of times when I see beginners that are just starting to tie, and the proportions are kind of tough to get the hang of, They'll come in here and they'll say, okay, the tail needs to be equal to the length of the body. Then they come in here and when they go to tie it in, they don't realize that their hands didn't adjust quite right. They throw a tail on there and it looks like that. AKA the fatty long tail from Uncle Ken. There's a YouTube video on the fatty long tail. If you want to learn how not to tie, that's the video to watch. Now, this is an easy fix though. Because if you saw, I only put two loose turns of thread on this on purpose. When I tie in a tail, I'm just going to do two loose turns, check to see where I'm sitting. I would realize at this point that I am tied in way too long and I can just grab those tails and pull those forward until I like the length, cinch it down a little bit, and then just wrap forward. Now if you realize that your thread's not far enough back, no problem, you can just bring that back and wrap back as well. But that way you can get your nymph tail tied on exactly where you want and how long you want it. And just with a few wraps, you can see that's that's in there. That, that's wrapped down super tight. Um, so that's a way to do it with pheasant tail. Um, another common one is with marabou. So let's say that I'm tying in marabou in a tail. And usually I just take my thumbnail and break it off. But here I'm going to use the nice tips. This is a really nice little chunk of marabou. So we're going to use it. Let's say I do the same thing. I tie this in. A couple loose turns. Maybe one more because it's a bigger clump of material. And I'm not happy with that. Same thing applies. Pull it to length. You can see I'm using this hand to guide this one. So that it won't rotate on either side of the hook. So once I get it where I want it. Again, lock that down. Break your thread. Oh no, if I did this well enough, Brig, I'll be able to save it. We'll see. Nope. Well, we destroyed that one, so watch this. You can even pull it out when your thread breaks. We're going to fix that. Man. I think. Oh, freak. I tried to break six out thread and I just cut myself. What is going on? Okay, I promise I've tied before. We're leaving it in. Brig, we're leaving it in. Okay, Leave the people need to see it. <laughs> Leave it in. Okay, so here we have that unruly piece of marabou. Um, we've got it tied in. We've got our finger cut because this thread is unbreakable. It's not even nano silk. 
few loose turns we're pulling it to length using my other finger to lock it down but don't he-man pull it or viking sit it as my buddy tim calls it wrap that forward and then we're set but this didn't look nearly as good as it did before i uh, decided to break my thread but anyway you get the picture that is how to adjust tails <clears throat> composite loops um my favorite uh, methodology on these I use on a fly called the Drunk Drea and it looks kind of terrible until it doesn't but this is kind of what this fly looks like and the collar as you can see this is a real simple fly um, the back of the fly just has a tail this was a Rasta flavor we did uh, we have a cool short on Instagram probably by now that shows it but anyway you can see all that's just one collar all this is in one dubbing loop and that's really really hard to do to put more than one type of material in a dubbing loop and this is super super durable um, I've fished these uh, for days in a row on trips caught a ton of fish on them and they just keep ticking so I'm going to show you my favorite way to do a composite loop and yes, huge shout out to Jerry French, those dudes up there in the Pacific Northwest that figured this out. That's how I learned how to do this. That's how I kind of saw the, the methodology. Now, if you, got, if you want to see like one of the best videos you'll watch, detail-oriented fly tying videos, go watch Jerry tie um, one of these composite loops. I kind of do more of a quick and dirty method because I don't fish for steelhead. They're too smart for me. I fish for dumb trout. Anyway, I kind of made a jig here. It looks like I'm just drawing patterns, but I'm going to kind of point this out. This, this line on this side is just kind of my baseline. That's where I'm, what I'm going to use to build my loops off of. And then I have line number one that kind of goes like this at an angle, and line number two that goes at a more extreme angle. Okay, So if I wanted a loop that was tapered, as I build this, I know that this is my, my center point. Essentially, this is where my thread is going to run. And so if I lay fibers from here to here, you know, all the way on this taper, I'm going to have a slightly bigger head once I get to the end of my loop. So you can really control these things, build tapers into it. So I just kind of made one for a narrow taper and more of an aggressive taper. So yeah, you could probably do game changers out of this stuff. So I also made a reverse angle in case I ever got a wild hair and needed to do a reverse loop. For today we probably won't mess with this stuff but just that shows you what that means. This is just a piece of foam board and I took a metallic marker to it. But we're just going to use this line in this in this video just so I can show you how I like to build a, a composite loop. Now we chose some really cool colors for you. We're going to throw marabou in it in those two colors like a sea foam and a lilac or a lavender. Ripple Ice Dub we're going to use in just, I think that's Mother of Pearl. Silver Ice Dub. Now, Ice Dubs are interesting because if you get the metallic colors, like the gold, the silver, um, when you pull those out, they're very straight and very movable. So those are critical in this kind of stuff. I really like it because it moves well. And then you can find colors as well, like this electric purple. It's kind of a metallic purple. It has the same consistency. So mess with your flash there's a billion different things you could put in this but I'm gonna start out by using some mother of pearl I'm gonna lay that down you know just kind of put that right on top of this this is just gonna be uh, like a binding layer um, this isn't gonna be super long it's just gonna kind of bind up on the the thread and um, just create a little bit of base for stuff to stick on okay so I'm gonna do it about like that um, let me show you this real quick. I've got this hook in the vise. So this is the fly that I'm going to tie. It just has a tail, dub body, and I have about this much um, space in the head of the fly that I'm going to wrap this loop on. So i got to keep that in mind. If I don't have a lot of room on my hook, my loop needs to be shorter. Um, so I've done this plenty of times. That's about the length that I'm going to need for a, a drunk dread pattern. All right. So now I'm going to take out some silver and because this is a little bit longer and I'm using my, you know, this line as kind of my base, 
I'm going to take this out and see how much longer this is. I'm going to lay that as close to that line as I can and let most of it hang over this edge. Okay, And you'll see why as we do this. Okay, So I'll just take a few light clumps. And if you have too much, no big deal. Just put your finger down really hard and pull some of it out of there. If it's not straight, you can put your finger down and kind of tease the fibers and then uh, hope it doesn't stick to your finger when you lift it off the table. All right, so two things of dubbing here. And now I'm going to take some marabou. I kind of cheated. I started prepping. I found some marabou that was relatively straight tapered. This is a real nice and full marabou. So in order to get this like cut out of there precisely and exactly how I want to lay this down, I'm going to take this D-loop tweezer that I'm going to use later in the video, and I'm just going to stick it in here on this marabou, and I'm going to come up here and just trim that, that stem out. I'm going to just adjust that one a little bit. So I'll just do it again. See that marabou? It didn't even know. They're in our house. You're going to play by our rules, Marabou. So you can get that as perfect as you want. really doesn't matter too much. And then I'm just going to come in here with the long bladed scissor and cut that out of there. Okay. So now I can take this Marabou and I'm going to kind of angle this just so I can get my hands in better. And I can either lay it down real nice and soft and then I can pinch it down and tease that out. Brigham, if you blow your nose and you get this all over the place, you're going to do trash duty for a month. Don't you do it. That's another thing. If you have a fan blowing, if you have coworkers who blow their nose very aggressively in front of the fly tank table, that kind of stuff, this will blow right off the table. Okay. So same thing for the next feather. This is a really nice piece of marabou here. I'll get about that much. You really don't want to get them too full. And now the cool thing is if I use that much on this fly, I can use the other half of it on the next fly. Cut that out of there. And we'll just place that down just like we did the other one. Pinch it down. Make them play nice with each other. All right, we had some break loose. That's fine. We'll just get those out of there. So there we have a really cool, nice loop. You can see our... Our reference line is going roughly right around the, the head of all these materials. We're just going to do a couple more things. We're going to add a little bit of flash now. Uh, Marabou and, and these, like this is the Shimmer Boo from Hairline. It's pretty cool stuff. And it, it just moves really well in the water a little better than, say, a, a more rigid flash -a boo or Crystal Flash. This really uh, is softer material. So I'm going to get, I don't know, uh, there are like eight strands of it there. And I'm just going to lay that on top and just kind of let it lay down. There's some shorter ones in there. I just want a few of them, so that's fine. And why not? We'll throw some purple ones in there. Let's try to hit this with one, one shot. So... I'll just stick that kind of in the middle. And one thing you can do with this is, say I have those purple ones in there, I can come in here just with like a little needle and get some fine tweezers as well. And you can move those all around. Okay, I'm going to just use my finger and cheat, line them back up, and now I'll roll them again. There, now we're spreading them out a little more. All right, so... We're pretty good there. If you try to get this perfect right off the bat, you can spend hours doing this and your fly is going to look awesome. But um, that's about as clean as I want it to get. Now, this is a cool tool from Loon. It's called the D-Loop Tweezer. And it's made for stuff just like this. It's got a real pointy po point. Oh, that was pointy. Put your hand down here real quick, Brig. Okay. Oh, dang it. Move, move it over a little bit. All right, so I'm going to open this up, and the resting position for this is closed, and there's quite a bit of tension. So I'm just going to take this, slide that up, scoop it up, like when Brigham played with the shovels at the playground. And how old were you in fourth grade? Like 14 or so? Anyway, you know, kind of like that. So I have this in hand. You can see how cool it is on one side. You got the dubbing. 
On the other side, you got all the marabou. It's lined up real nice. But we're going to take our scissors and cut this. And you don't want to cut it so close to the tweezers that it's hard to put in a dubbing loop. So now, we're ready. We're ready to throw this in the, the fly and see what happens. Okay, I've, tr I've tried to position my vise in a way that you can see it. It's a little bit further away from the table, so wish me luck. This is, this is a challenge. Um, this is a fly that you're not just going to pick up and tie a dozen in an hour. Um, this, this fly really is a challenge to tie. So anyway, what I'm going to do is just make a, a dubbing loop. It doesn't need to be super long. It shouldn't be extra long or else it'll take forever to twist up. Close off the back side of it and then just make sure you got some nice thread wraps going to the, the, the eye of the hook. All right. I like to use, I'm just using this CNF top twister. It's pretty cool, it spins really nice. And I'll just load that in. Thank you, Brigham. I'm gonna open this up and you kinda of have to hold this really close to the entry of the, the dubbing loop. You can't hold it at an angle or it just won't go in. It kinda of feels weird, but I'm just gonna put that in there and the thread's running right along the same line of that, that clamp. So now I'm going to open that up. I'm putting my finger here to keep the thread tight as well. That keeps that thread uh, just pinched right on that loop. And usually if I talk too much during this part, it will fall apart. But one thing I will tell you is get good muscle memory of keeping this open the whole way out. You will do this. You'll open it up and then you grab it about right here and then yank it all out of there. And then you get to build it again. That's when you swear. And that's when Brigham says, oh, shucky darn hot dogs, like that. So get, yeet that one out of there. That was a hater. He didn't want to play. So guess what? Go live somewhere else, piece of flash. All right. The moment of truth. Twist that sucker up, and it's going to look like you just ruined your half-hour investment. That does not look good. Enter Strong Bodkin. People ask me all the time, why would you get an expen expensive bodkin like the Stonfo? But as you can see, there's a taper that goes all the way up this bodkin. So I can use this and really put a lot of pressure on this bodkin and it won't bend. So find a strong bodkin. If you have an upholstery needle, stick it in a piece of driftwood and you're good. But what I'm doing here is I'm finding the entry of that dubbing loop with the tip of this bodkin and it will just kind of work its way down all the way down through that. Okay, so as you can see, this is picking out those fibers quite nicely. However, on the bottom side, we're still pretty gnarly. So we're going to just come at it from this direction. And we're just going to keep doing this until we get less resistance when we're picking it out. It means that we've got all the snarls and tangles out of there. One time Brigham had dreadlocks in his hair. And it looked just like this. And he had to spend hours and hours... A lot of trials and tribulations in the Wilson ha household when he's trying to manage his dreadlocks. He was just a young boy. He just wanted to come and mow your yard and be nice. And so this is the same type of thing that he was doing when he was doing that. And it's frustrating. You know, just let the kid come in. Let him mow your lawn. And boom. So tell yourself a little story like that. And now you end up with a really cool looking brush that still looks pretty gnarly. And guess what? This fly, these composite loops, you can you can uh, spend a lot of time you know picking them all out as you wrap them. But as you can see, I kind of go for the quick and dirty method, and then we can fix it all at the end. But this fly is about to look a lot worse before it looks better. Enter moisture. Um, they said I can't lick my fingers. Um, it was grossing out the customers, so I'm using water. Actually, I think the finger licking got cured when everyone had to walk around with masks on. So anyway, I may or may not have tied the fly, this one, that has a lot of sample of my DNA on it because I use a lot of saliva on that bad boy. Anyway, but we're not going to do that on this one. Um, I'm just going to try to get this to the proper level of moistened that it won't undo so as you can see that's a pretty clean loop and if you look 
We spent a little bit of time picking that out, but the core of this dubbing loop is really, really fine. Like it's almost just right on the thread. So just like a soft hackle, you're gonna get those fingers in there and you're just going to preen those back with every wrap. And you do want to, to take your time wrapping this forward. Um, some of them will catch on top of each uh, of themselves, but we can easily comb that out. All right, so we're just moving that forward, preening each time. And this is kind of a messy tie off if you have to trim it short or trim it uh, and not use the whole loop. As you can see, I've done quite a few of these, so I'm terminating right up by the head on this one. That's just practice. Um, and there are times where I got to trim it off as well. So really small thread head. Trim that out of there and we'll throw a quick whip finish on it. We're just going to pretty this up a little bit. Okay, now is where this fly does not look very good at all. And I'm going to ask my assistant, Vanna Wilson, to come help me because I have one of these. This is a, what does that say? Oh, polar? It's just basically a, a dusting device. So I'm going to dry this off so I can show you the drunk dray in all its glory and, and the really the reason why this compound loop is so awesome. You'll see how it will swim in the water. Brig, will you come blow on this from over here? No. <laughs> Freaking dumbass. Get your assistant to start using the air. So we're just brushing that out and drying it at the same time. Now I'll have Brig go over to the other side of the fly and we're going to brush it the opposite way, mostly just to dry it out. Oh my goodness. And we're getting a tail too. Perfect. Okay, now go over there, Brigham. We got marabou flying everywhere here. Now just give that a little, a little thing. So check that out. This is how this swims in the water. Okay, let that sit for a second now. There you go. This is why this fly works so well. So when I fish the drunk Drea, I'll cast it and strip it. And when it strips, it gets really thin. And then as soon as it pauses, it just puffs out like this because that collar just wants to grow. So anyway, this style of fly is also super, super durable. Uh, we were on a trip down to Argentina one time and I had a drunk Drea that was working so well I think I fished it four out of the seven days. I had sharpened it maybe 16 times and the part of the fly that stayed together the longest was the collar. So anyway, it's also a very, very durable fly. So if you want to go to arts and crafts class and tie a cool fly like that, go for it. This is the one for you. Um, in my opinion, this technique is a five out of five skill level because it's going to take you three or four of them before you even feel comfortable with it. And by the time you get this technique down, it's super, super rewarding and useful in many, many different types of flies.